Hello everybody. Okay, so welcome to our next set of videos where we're going to talk about the colligative properties of solutions. Now in the previous video I showed you a demonstration of one of those colligative properties, namely boiling point elevation. And there are four different types of colligative properties that we're going to discuss. Boiling point elevation, vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. There's actually also going to be another one called Henry's Law that's going to be sort of a, a sidetrack off of vapor pressure lowering that we'll get into a little bit later. But first off, what is a colligative property? Simply put, a colligative property is an aspect of the solution that has been changed because you've added a solute to it. And what's the most important factor about a colligative property isn't so much what solute you add to the solvent, but really, as I've indicated over here, how much solute that you add. So all of these four properties, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, osmotic pressure, they're really not going to care so much about what it is that you use as a solute, but they're going to care about mostly how much solute particles are in the system. So what we're going to do is we're going to start here with vapor pressure lowering. So I'm going to go ahead, get rid of my face here, and we're going to move over and take a look at vapor pressure lowering. So let's take a look at this portion of the page. We're actually going to start by taking a look at these cartoons of beakers that I have here towards the bottom, because they set up the basic idea of what we're looking at. It turns out that when you have a pure solvent system, like I'm showing here on the left, so these white blobs, or excuse me, these blue blobs are supposed to represent solvent molecule. As you know, some of those solvent molecules will evaporate into the gas phase. And if we allow enough time to pass, we eventually get an equilibrium between the liquid and the gas phase, and we can go ahead and measure the vapor pressure of this liquid. And I'm calling the vapor pressure of a pure solvent here P superscript zero solvent. So that's the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So for something like water, the vapor pressure of water at about room temperature is in the neighborhood of 24 millimeters of mercury. Okay, So that's our P zero solvent. It turns out that when you put a solute into the solvent, as I'm showing in this cartoon hot here on the right, my solute particles are being represented by these orange blobs. It turns out that the vapor pressure of the solution is less than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. In other words, there are fewer solvent molecules that evaporate into the gas phase. Now, an important feature to keep in mind at this point is that our solute particles themselves cannot evaporate. And that's what I mean up here when I say non-volatile solute. Non-volatile is, in this context, a fancy way of saying it can't evaporate. So the solute particles themselves do not add to the vapor pressure. Down below, down towards here where you see the purple writing, we're going to change that condition a little later on. But for now, the solute itself does not evaporate. So the only material in my solution system that can actually evaporate will just be solvent particles. And it doesn't matter what your solvent is or what your solute is. It's always true 100% of the time that the vapor pressure of the solution is always less than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. And we can quantify this effect. And the first person to quantify this was a scientist named Raoult, as you can see up here. And he developed what was called Raoult's Law. Now, there are some limitations to Raoult's Law. It actually doesn't work very well for a broad range of concentrations but it does work pretty well within a limited range. So we're going to take a closer look now at this chart I've got up here. So what I'm showing here on this chart is the vapor pressure of the solution versus chi of solvent. Chi. You remember what that unit is? right? That's mole fraction. So I am measuring the vapor pressure as a function of the mole fraction of the solvent. And my chi of solvent ranges from 0 to 1. Now, if it's at 0, 
that basically means that I don't have any solvent. The only thing I have would be the dried out solute, and so you can see there's no vapor pressure if I have a mole fraction of solvent equal to zero. On the other extreme, I could have only solvent, so the mole fraction of the solvent would be one. If the only thing I have in the system is solvent, its mole fraction is one, and you can see there that the vapor pressure is equal to the P superscript zero the same vapor pressure I would have if I just had pure solvent. All right, so that's sort of the upper limit of the vapor pressure in my system. And it turns out that Raoul observed, or what he thought he was observing, was a linear relationship, as shown here by the blue line, a linear relationship between the vapor pressure of the solution and the mole fraction of the solvent. And he quantified this according to his law right here, Raoult's law. The vapor pressure of the solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent multiplied by the P0 of the solvent. Now this has the benefit of showing mathematically that it must be true that the vapor pressure of the solution is always, as we said down here, and as we always observed, is always less than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Why? Because chi of solvent can't be larger than 1. So once you have a solution, your chi solvent is some value less than 1. Now here's the kick when it comes to Raoult's law, or here's really the limitation. Raoult's law really only holds when we're talking about fairly dilute solutions. In other words, conditions where the mole fraction of the solvent is closer to 1. You can see what I'm showing here in the red and green lines, and I'll get to them in a second. I'm showing real solution behavior. The blue shows ideal solution behavior, what the vapor pressure would theoretically be if Raoult's law was held vigorously. But it turns out, with real systems, only at dilute concentrations, again, chi solvent near 1, does Raoult's law hold. Most of the time, we have one, or one of two conditions. We have either a vapor pressure that is larger than predicted by Raoult's law, as we see here in red, that would be called a positive deviation. Or we have a vapor pressure that's lower than what is predicted by Raoult's law. As shown here in green, that's a negative deviation. The important thing to keep in mind, though, is regardless of the deviation, the vapor pressure of the solution is still always less than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So, it may be true that under a positive deviation, the vapor pressure predicted by Raoult's law is too low. When you actually go ahead and measure it, it's a little higher than that predicted by Raoult's law. Or it could be true that the deviation is negative. You do the calculation, you get a number, and then you go into the lab and you do the actual experiment, and the vapor pressure value is actually lower than expected. Now, I'm going to wrap this video up with a question. What sorts of interparticle forces do I need to think about to help me understand a positive deviation and a negative deviation? When I have a positive deviation, what that's telling me is that the solvent has a tendency to want to evaporate more than what is predicted by Raoult's law. More of it wants to go into the vapor phase. Now, what must be true about the various intramolecular forces involved between the solute and the solvent particles for that to be the case? Conversely, what must be true about a negative deviation? So it turns out, in a negative deviation, the solvent molecules don't want to evaporate as much as they would predicted by Raoult's law. So then what must be true about the intramolecular forces involved in the solute and the solvent interactions that will lead me to a negative deviation? All right, so this is our first colligative property that we quantify here via Raoult's law. It certainly has its limitations. It's only really good for dilute solutions. But then we can begin to rationalize positive and negative deviations with respect to things like interparticle forces. So think about that. What must be true 
about the various intermolecular forces that are present between the solute and the solvent to lead to positive and negative deviations. All right, that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll pick up our conversation with some more colligative properties.